Hello, I'm Merlin Tuttle, the founder of Modern Bat Conservation, and in this program I will share experiences illustrating the power of simple friendship in overcoming seemingly insurmountable obstacles. When I announced the founding of an organization dedicated to saving bats, even my best friends thought I was crazy. It was 1982, and media headlines were full of warnings of rabid bats attacking people, especially children. Americans were spending millions of dollars annually to kill bats. Even the few conservationists who knew better viewed saving bats as hopeless. I quickly learned that getting into angry arguments with people who kill bats accomplished nothing. Progress demanded that I understand the roots of their fear. That meant calmly asking questions. What was the problem? You were terrified? What caused you to be so frightened? You must have had a really bad experience. Tell me about it. Maybe I can help. Key steps soon became clear. Accept the idea that even bad haters likely have what at least to them appear to be good reasons. Sincerely try to understand those reasons. Be well informed and be clear in your actions that your first priority is helping people. Here's how such an approach helped me in one of my early encounters. A family near my home in Milwaukee had made outrageous newspaper headlines. They were demanding legalization of DDT for killing bats, said to be terrorizing their children. I went to their home and explained that I'd read about their problems. And as a bat researcher for the Milwaukee Public Museum, I was wondering if I could be of help. When I asked what had frightened them so badly, they admitted having read a scary magazine article claiming bats seen in their yard would attack children. I showed them one of their local bats up close, explained that it could catch up to a thousand mosquito-sized insects in a single hour, and that in a lifetime of studying bats, I'd never once been attacked or met anyone who had. In just a few minutes, they decided that bats were not only okay, but were cute and welcome. They even offered to help educate their neighbors. Had I confronted these people, viewing them as crazy or irresponsible, based on their newspaper quotes, I'm sure the outcome would have been very different. I refer to my approach as winning friends, not battles. And over decades of improvement, I found that it applies to much of life. No matter how we may differ in our views on the environment, politics, or religion, we can still be friends. There are endless opportunities to collaborate on areas of mutual concern like health and safety, both of which are enhanced by good conservation practices. And solutions must be flexible as illustrated in the following examples. In the early 1980s, flying foxes in American Samoa were threatened with extinction. Thousands were being shot and sold to Chamorros in Guam as a food delicacy. Paul Cox, a leading Pacific Island botanist, urged me to intervene. And Vern Marion Reed, two of my favorite conservation sponsors, funded a trip and organized a meeting with Governor Lutali. While my collaborators spent the first day resting from the overnight flight, I went alone to find the commercial hunters. I introduced myself as a scientist interested in learning about their bats, and they invited me to accompany them that night on a hunt. Knowing my companions were, to put it mildly, unlikely to approve, I went alone. The hunters were able to shoot just two bats in the whole evening, but explained that a year earlier, they could have shot a hundred or more in a single hour. When I questioned them about the dramatic change, they readily admitted that they and other commercial hunters had shot too many. They also admitted sadness that their flying foxes might soon entirely disappear. So I explained how in the United States mainland, hunters had gained legislation with limited hunting seasons and bag limits to ensure a future for their favorite game animals. The bat hunters were interested but doubted that they could gain such protection in Samoa. When I returned to our hotel, my traveling companions were horrified. Making friends with despicable killers of their favorite animals was going too far. 
They want an immediate end to all killing of flying foxes. Nevertheless, I eventually persuaded them that a compromise was better than potentially losing the bats entirely. By the time we met with the governor, the hunters had accepted my offer of help, and game laws were passed within just six months. Though my colleagues were initially unhappy not to have ended all flying fox hunting, my make friends first compromise ended up achieving far more than we could ever have anticipated. The hunters became invaluable partners. They not only agreed to end the commercial hunting, they also enthusiastically collaborated with us in gain a national park. The park now protects unique habitats from coral reefs to cloud forest mountaintops. And as an example of the power of converting the perceived enemy, the hunters additionally declared a self-imposed moratorium on all flying fox hunting, one that has lasted for more than 25 years. Thanks to our bat hunting friends, Samoa's flying foxes have recovered from the brink of extinction. In Austin, Texas, when hundreds of thousands of free-tail bats began moving into newly created crevices beneath the Congress Avenue Bridge, health officials warned that they were rabid and dangerous. The Austin American Statesman newspaper ran stories like bat colonies sink teeth into city, and newspapers throughout America ran stories claiming that hundreds of thousands of rabid bats were invading and attacking the citizens of Austin. Citizens were actually signing petitions to have their bats eradicated. I simply met with city, health department, and media leaders and asked questions, listened to concerns, and explained the potential benefits of saving their bats. Of course, I also offered to help. I didn't condemn anyone for the past, but I did provide a workshop for the health department, spoke at an annual bridge designers conference, and gave interviews for local news media. Soon the city began organizing special bat celebrations. The Austin American Statesman provided a special bat viewing area and a bat mascot. The Department of Transportation, who formerly had killed bats in bridges, built bat habitat into new bridges that now provide homes for millions of additional bats. They also have published a beautiful brochure with directions to the best bat viewing bridges. Today, the Congress Avenue Bridge Colony alone attracts 10 million tourist dollars annually and consumes tons of crop and yard pests nightly. No one has been attacked or contracted a disease from our 1.5 million bats and the colony has become an internationally famous example of how conserving bats helps people. In the late 1980s and early 90s, American bats faced huge losses as state and federal governments began mandating safety closures of hundreds of thousands of old abandoned mines. Unknown even to most bat researchers, millions of bats had moved into these shelters of last resort when their original homes and caves had gradually been lost to commercialization, disturbance, and permanent destruction. In November 1991, I received an urgent call from a caver named Steve Smith. He and a couple of his friends had roped down a 200-foot deep shaft to explore the old Millie Hill mine located in Iron Mountain, Michigan. The mine had been abandoned for decades and was considered extremely dangerous. It was scheduled for permanent closure within weeks. However, the cavers had discovered an estimated half million or more hibernating bats. And without prompt intervention, one of America's largest remaining bat populations could have been buried alive. I quickly convinced the Michigan Department of Natural Resources to assign one of their biologists, Bob Depker, the task of quickly convincing city and mine officials to save the bats. A week later, Bob called me. He was alarmed. Not a single one of the decision-making officials had returned his calls. Worse yet, they appeared to be speeding closure preparations. What good were bats? Why not just complete the work before learning about their presence? Both of us were deeply offended. 
It was tempting to declare an emergency, call major news media and teach those guys a lesson. Nevertheless, I hated breaking my record of winning friends instead of battles. So as a last resort, I asked Bob, how much time do you think we have before the closure begins? His answer, probably at least a couple weeks. Encouraged, I asked Bob to call the principals at the two Iron Mountain Elementary Schools and ask if they'd be interested in having a National Geographic photographer speak to their students. Of course, they were delighted, so I quickly arranged to fly to Iron Mountain with Zoe, a straw-colored flying fox. My bat was a huge hit. At each school, I unmercifully baited the children with promises of all the neat bats I'd show them if they could just get their parents to bring them down to the county library two nights later. I hoped that at least a few parents would be community leaders. To even my amazement, more than 200 children and parents showed up, and they included the mayor and other important leaders. I simply introduced the world of bats and their values, concluding with the discovery of the Millie Hill Mines Little Brown Bats and the fact that just one could catch a thousand mosquito-sized insects in a single hour. I didn't even ask for help in saving the bats. When I finished, the mayor jumped up and thanked me profusely for coming to Iron Mountain and promised his full support for saving the bats. In almost no time, community members volunteered special skills, resources, the mine entrance was stabilized, and a steel cage was constructed to make it safe for both people and bats. The community, including the Cleveland Cliffs Mining Company, took great pride in protecting so many bats. And at the news conference dedication ceremony, I gave high praise to all concerned. The public relations representative for the company was especially happy. He explained that this is the first time in his life he could remember in which a mining company had benefited from an encounter with conservationists. He gave me his business card and offered full cooperation in opening doors with the mining industry. As a direct result, we partnered with his company in co-hosting a Great Lakes Region workshop on how to detect and conserve bats and mines. And that event, opened the door to major companies nationally and internationally. Companies reported saving approximately 90% of their anticipated closure costs through cooperation with conservationists. And they got great PR as well. They ended up actually looking for additional opportunities to collaborate with bat conservationists. Uncounted millions of bats ended up protected permanently in mine sanctuaries instead of being buried enclosures. Just one of those mines, the Uniman Company's magazine mine in Illinois, as a direct result of partnership protection, now shelters one of America's largest populations of endangered Indiana bats. Today, many companies proudly help bats. I shudder to think what could have happened if in a weak moment of anger we had forsaken friendship for battle. As my personal experiences have repeatedly demonstrated, even perceived enemies can become partners in lasting progress. We've all made mistakes, but it's only our future actions that count. Winning friends instead of battles is fun, less risky, and much more likely to endure. The potential is enormous. I hope through sharing these experiences, I've given courage to others to tackle additional seemingly impossible challenges. Thank you.